Well, boys and girls, mums and dads, we love doing this program for families. It's called Dinosaurs and More. And as we get underway, I'm going to ask you to put your hands up in answer to some questions I'm going to ask. Put your hands up if you've heard of the word evolution. Oh, look, I think everybody has, around the world, actually. Put your hands up if you've heard that people supposedly evolved from ape-like creatures. Yeah, I think we've all heard that. And put your hands up if you believe, or not believe, but if you've heard that we came from, dino uh, that dinosaurs lived 65 to 200 million years ago. Yeah, I think we've all heard that dinosaurs lived 65 to 200 million years ago. Well, I want to tell you right from the start today that Buddy and I don't believe in evolution. Evolution is the idea some people have to try to explain life without God. They believe it just came about by chance random processes. It'd be sort of like this. Here's a church building. How did it get there? Well, somebody put a load of bricks, put a stick of dynamite, there was an explosion, and look what happened. Do you think that could happen by chance random processes? No, not at all. You realize that that church building had to be designed by someone, yet for humans, we're so much more complicated than a building. So somebody far greater than a human intelligence had to design us, and that's the God of the Bible. And we're going to talk about that today. So we don't believe in evolution. We don't believe that dinosaurs lived millions of years ago. And we certainly don't believe we evolved from ape-like creatures. I mean, did your grandfather look like that? Don't think so. Did your grandmother look like that? No. Did you walk in like this? See the gorilla over here? That's part of the ape kind. Did you walk in looking like that? I don't think so. Now, we're going to do a little experiment here, OK? So put your hands in the air. Let's do that. Touch your fingers with your thumb. Now do the same with your big toe and little toes. Can you do that? <laughs> I hope you can't. Because if you can, you shouldn't be here. Because this is a human foot, and this is a chimp's foot, but it doesn't look like a foot. It looks like what? A hand. And so you see, they're designed to do what they do, and we're designed to do what we do. We don't do what they do. They don't do what we do. In fact, uh, here's a man, and he's looking at a chimp, and he says, I can think, compose music, build bridges, fly airplanes, make computers, and all you can do is what? Think about banana. Do you realize how grating that is? Banana. That's an American way of saying it. It is. Yeah. See, Australian language is much more musical. It is. I mean, you think of it as banana. Can you say banana? Banana. See how musical that sounds? It sounds pretty good. Yeah, yeah it, it sounds does, pretty doesn't good. it? Okay, now I hope you know how to say it the right way. So we certainly don't believe we came from ape-like creatures. We're very different uh, to the apes. We believe what the Bible tells us. You know, this is God's book to us. God had people write a book for us to tell us who we are, where we came from, where the whole universe came from. He tells us about major events in history so we can understand this world. We also are told about a problem we have called sin and the solution in Jesus. And you know, it's interesting. The very first verse of the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Notice it says, in the beginning, God. In other words, God is there. He's always been there. He's outside of time. He's the eternal God. He's the infinite creator God. I had a little boy once come up to me on stage and he said, Mr. Ham, he's about, you know, nine years old, and he said, Mr. Ham, well, who made God then? And I said, well, son, here's the problem. If somebody made God, you have to have a bigger God who made God, right? Yes, sir. Well, I said, now you've got another problem. Yes, sir. Well, who made the bigger God? You have to have a bigger, bigger God who made the big God who made God, right? Well, yes, sir. I said, now you've got a problem. He said, I know. Who made the bigger, bigger God? You have to have a bigger, bigger, bigger God who made the bigger, big God who made the big God who made God, right? Yes, sir. Now you've got a problem. I know. And I said, see, you can keep going back and getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until you get to the biggest God of all, which is the God of the Bible, the creator God who's outside of time. You know why we find that hard to even understand? Because we're created in time. You know, when God made the heavens and the earth, it says in the beginning, he made time, he made space, he made matter, and then he created us so that we can exist in time. We have a beginning, but God didn't have a beginning. And that's why the Bible says there's always a faith aspect when it comes to understanding that, because we're created beings. But you know what God has done? He's given us a book so that we can understand all about the universe and how it came to be and all the things that have happened. And we're going to talk about that today. And we're particularly going to use the Bible to explain dinosaurs. Now, we're going to talk about a lot of other subjects as well, but we're going to talk about dinosaurs too. And so, buddy, I'm going to give them a little test here, okay? Okay. Uh, okay, I want you to be thinking... I want you to be thinking the names of some prehistoric creatures, all right? Just think of names of some prehistoric creatures, and then I'm going to count to three and then yell out the name of a prehistoric creature that you've thought of. You ready? All right. One, two, three. Oh, I heard a lot of different names. Heard a lot of names, yeah. Yeah, but what they don't know is that 
sorry to tell you this, but I led you into a trap. And snap, I caught you. <laughs> See, prehistoric, hmm, wait a minute. We have a Bible that God has given us, and history began from when it was recorded in Genesis 1-1, so how can there be prehistoric anything? See, we've been impacted by the world, and we don't even realize it, right? So the next time somebody says, do you know any prehistoric animals, you say, prehistoric? Wait a minute. History began from when it was recorded in the Bible, Genesis 1-1, and that's your right answer for that. Well, Buddy and I are going to go through the history book of the universe for you. In fact, that's what we call the Bible, the history book of the universe. Let's say that together. You ready? The history book of the universe. What is the Bible? The history book of the universe. And you know, at the Creation Museum, how many of you have already been to the Creation Museum? Oh, lots of hands. Look at that. And hope the rest of you are going to go to the Creation Museum. Incredible place. Well, one of the centerpiece sections of the Creation Museum, we have lots of exhibits there and theaters, planetarium and beautiful gardens and animal experience and so on. But one section, we walk you through the whole Bible. It's called the Seven Seas of History. We walk you through creation, corruption, catastrophe, confusion. That's Genesis 1 to 11. That's foundational to the rest of the Bible and to the gospel and to all of our, our doctrines. And so based on the seven seas of history, which is Genesis to Revelation, Buddy and I have come up with a presentation to help you understand dinosaurs and everything else on this earth, and we call it the seven ages of dinosaurs. Now, I want you to remember this. The next time somebody says to you, do you believe in the age of dinosaurs millions of years ago? Here's what I want you to say. No, I believe in seven ages of dinosaurs. That will really confuse them. Okay, so do you believe in the age of dinosaurs 65 to 200 million years ago? You say, no, I believe in seven ages of dinosaurs. Exactly. We're going to go through those ages and I'll show them to you in a group, first of all, and then we'll go through them one at a time. So as I put them up, just call out the age. Okay, you'll see the word on the screen. The first age is formed. Second age is fearless. Third age is fallen. Fourth age is flood, fifth age is faded, sixth age is found, and the seventh age, that's the age we live in today, we call it fiction. What is it? You know what fiction means? Not true. What does fiction mean? Not true. Because we live in an age where we're told a lot of things that are not true, like millions of years, evolution, that people supposedly came from ape-like creatures. And we certainly don't believe that. So we're going to go through these one at a time. Formed. When did God form? When did he make dinosaurs? Well, the Bible tells us God made everything on six days and rested for one. Stop right there for a moment. I'm going to test Buddy Davis. I mean, he's, well, it's been millions of years since he went to school. <laughs> but we'll see, we'll see how his mathematics does, okay? Buddy, six plus one equals? Seven. Pretty good. Look at that. Pretty good. Seven. You know what? Six plus one equals seven. Put your hand up if you have an 11-day week at your house. Hmm. Put your hand up if you have a 12-day week at your house. Okay, put your hand up if you have a seven-day week at your house. Oh, wow. Look at, you know why they have a seven-day week? There's only one reason in the entire universe. You know what it is? God made everything in six days and rested for one, and six plus one equals what? Seven. By the way, if God made everything for six million years and rested for millions of years... That'd be an interesting week. It wouldn't work, would it? <laughs> wouldn't work at all. No, God made everything in six days and rested for one. And he tells us what he did on each day. On day one, he made time, he made space, he made matter. On day two, he separated waters. On day three, he made the dry land and the plants. And it says he gathered the waters into one place. Presumably, there was one continent, one major continent, uh, all in one place. And then day four, the sun, moon, and stars. Day five, the sea creatures and the flying creatures. Day six, the land animals and man. In fact, he made two people. What were their names? Adam and Eve. That's right. And you know how God made the animals? He said, let the earth bring forth the living creatures. But you know how he made humans? Do you know what he said? Let us make man in our image. In other words, we're different to the animals. And God made us in a different way. No animal was made in God's image. Only humans were made in God's image. I want you to remember that. So even though we have a body like a mammal's body, we're not just an animal. I want you to say after me, I'm not just an animal. I am special. I'm made in the image of God. 
And I want you to always remember that. Well, you know, I was trying to think, what country in the world has the best, most exciting, wonderful animals that we could talk about? So I did a lot of research, and for some reason or other, I decided on Australia. <laughs> that was totally unbiased, obviously. But I'm going to share with you some of the exciting animals from my homeland of Australia. And I want us to be thinking about the fact God obviously created these. Let's look at this one. What's the name of this one? Koala. Koala. You know, a koala has a pouch, which means it's what sort of animal? Marsupial. That's right. And I know every boy and girl in America and mums and dads want to go to Australia and do what I've done and cuddle a koala. Of course, one of the best kept secrets in Australia is that in the wild, they're smelly flea bitten barmets that rip your eyeballs out. But we don't tell too many people about that. But here's another one of my favorite animals. What's the name of that one? Kangaroo. And here's a joey. This is young kangaroo. Do you know when a kangaroo is born, it's like a little red jelly bean, if you can imagine, with a mouth, two legs, can't see. It knows where to go, what to do, and how to do it. And it crawls up its mother's pouch, knows where to go, what to do, and how to do it. And crawls into the pouch, knows where to go, what to do, and how to do it. And attaches itself to its mother's milk to develop from there. Who thinks that happened by chance, random, evolutionary processes of dumb luck over millions of years? Huh. Who thinks it was designed that way? Ah, you know what I tell my grandchildren? It's designed to do what it does do, what it does do, what it does do well, doesn't it? Don't you think I think it does do you? I do hope you do too, do you? Can you say that? No. You can't say that? Hmm, okay, we'll have to see if we can get you to say it. Here's another one of my favorite animals. It's a wombat. A wombat has a pouch, but the pouch faces backwards and the young jump into the rear end. And I had an evolutionist say to me, if God created the wombat, why did he create it with a backward facing pouch? Well, wombats tunnel under the ground so if the pouch faced forward, it'd fill up with dirt and you'd get fossilized wombats real quickly, wouldn't you? <laughs> do you know what I say to my grandchildren? It's designed to do what it does do, what it does do, it does do well, doesn't it? Don't you think I think it does do you? I do hope you do too, do you? Can you say that yet? No. Can't say that yet? Hmm. What's my favorite animal of all time? Platypus. Ah, the platypus. You know why? They first discovered it in Australia in 1797, Hawkesbury River near Sydney, sent it back to England, and the scientists actually thought somebody had found different animals and cut bits off them and stitch them all together. And you know why they thought that? You think of an animal that has a bill like a duck and beaver like tail and hair like a bear and web feet like an otter and claws like a reptile, lays eggs like a turtle, feeds its young or milk like a mammal, has spurs like a rooster and poison like a snake. I mean, if, if it evolved, it evolved from everything. You know what I think? Every time an evolutionist looks at the platypus, I think God smiles because I think he made it just for them. And you know what I say to my grandchildren? It's designed to do what it does do, what it does do, it does do well, doesn't it? Don't you think I think it does do you? I do hope you do too, do you? Can you say that yet? Okay, we're going to say it together. All right, we'll do it nice and slowly first and see how we go. On the count of three, stay with me. You ready? One, two, three. It's designed to do what it does do, what it does do, it does do well, doesn't it? Yes, it does. I think it does. Do you? I do. Hope you do too, do you? That was pathetic. <laughs> I, I've heard better. Heard better? It was pathetic. <laughs> <sighs> okay. I'm going to pretend I never heard that. We're going to do it again. We're going to go a little faster this time and see, say it a little louder and see how we go. See if you can keep up with me better this time. You ready? Count of three. One, two, three. It's designed to do what it does do, what it does do, it does do well, doesn't it? Yes, it does. I think it does. Do you? I do. Hope you do too. Do you? An improvement. Slightly better than pathetic. <laughs> Slight. Let's try it another time, third time, okay. All right, count of three, one, two, three. It's designed to do what it does do, what it does do, it does do well, doesn't it? Yes, it does, I think it does, do you, I do, hope you do too, do you? Okay, now you've had enough practice. Let's see if you can keep up with me and how good you are, all right? Are you ready? Okay, you've got to get ready for this. This is really fast. On the count of... One, two, three. It's designed to do what it does do, what it does do, it does do well, doesn't it? Yes, it does. I think it does. Do you? I do. Hope you do too. Do you? Okay, you can give yourselves a clap. I think you did pretty good. Well, you know what, buddy? Uh, I talked about Australian animals, and I guess, you know, there's probably an animal worth talking about from America. Well, there's uh, a lot of animals in America uh -huh. we can talk about that's really cool animals. Yep. But one in particular that I'd like to talk about. Well, you know what? You know what I did? I, I thought to myself, what would Buddy Davis think was a fantastic animal to talk about? And I took a guess. Let's see if you're right. Okay. How about this one? You're right. How did you know that? Kim? I just guessed. Um, that's, that's isn't that really amazing? I, I knew what you were going to do. Yeah. And, and you know why I thought this one? 
Why? I, I wonder if you think the same thing. Because of its tongue. That's what I want to talk about. Oh, see, there we, we are. Okay. Yeah. That, that's amazing. That's amazing, Ken. Well, I do love the woodpecker. There's a lot of things I could tell you guys about the woodpecker, but I'm just going to talk about its tongue. What an amazing tongue God designed in the woodpecker. Most birds have a relatively short tongue in their beak, right? Not a very big tongue at all in most birds. But, uh, but the woodpecker, God designed it so it has a long, long, skinny tongue. And on top of that, most birds' tongue will end right back here in the throat. That's where the tongue stops in most critters. But not the woodpecker. God designed the woodpecker so it has an extension on the back of its tongue. And the woodpecker's tongue wraps all the way around the skull and sticks inside of the right nostril. Ooh. Yep. The woodpecker keeps part of its tongue inside of its nose. <laughs> I tell that to boys and girls years ago, cool. <laughs> so when the woodpecker's drawing on a tree, grrr, discovers, oh, there's a hole there. I wonder what's inside that hole. The woodpecker takes that long, skinny tongue of his, sticks it down inside that long, tight, skinny hole. Now, how's a woodpecker going to tell the difference between a bug or a piece of sawdust? God thinks of everything. God designed little tiny whiskers on the tip of that woodpecker's tongue that will tickle it. It can feel that movement. All the woodpecker thinks, this is a bug. It's not sawdust. I can eat this. Problem. How's the woodpecker now going to draw that bug out of that long, tight, skinny hole? God thinks of everything. God made a factory in that woodpecker's tongue that makes glue. It does. It's like a glue factory in the woodpecker's tongue. It makes a sticky substance. The woodpecker doesn't know any of this is working, and it had better work or you're not going to have a woodpecker, so the woodpecker will glue the bug to the tip of its tongue. Now, the woodpecker has a bug glued to its tongue, so it draws that bug out of that long, tight, skinny hole. Now, the woodpecker has a bug in its beak. How's it going to swallow the bug? It's glued to its tongue. God thinks of everything. God made another factory in that woodpecker's tongue, but this one is a dissolving factory that automatically dissolves that glue, automatically dissolves that sticky substance so that woodpecker can swallow that bug. I don't know about you guys. That is an awful lot of things that has to happen by time, matter, and chance and tells me we have an awesome God knows how to do all the details right from the get-go and design that information in a bird we call the woodpecker. God's amazing. Well, wow, buddy, you're getting excited. You better oh. be careful at your age. <laughs> well, you get I get that excited. I get excited with God's creation. That's just one of the many things I get excited about. Well, how about you sing a song? You have a song about the woodpecker. I wrote a song about the and woodpecker. We'll ask our resident music group here, our resident singing group, Steve Hess and Southern Salvation. And just to make sure you fit in with the talk here, Steve is officially a living fossil. <laughs> and we have John and Matt with him. And they're going to sing the choruses of these songs to help you sing along as well. So you ready yeah, for this yeah, one? Yeah, I'm ready. This is a fast song, guys. It's a fast song, so I need to talk as many people into clapping your hands along with us as I can talk into doing that. It helped keep us on time, right? Yes. And so we'll have some fun singing about the woodpecker. The woodpecker song goes like this. Uh, How much wood does a woodpecker pack? What a woodpecker packs on wood. When a woodpecker packs that woodpecker packs as much wood as it should pack wood. God made the woodpecker on day five and finished, he said, it's good. How much wood does a woodpecker pack when a woodpecker packs on wood? You think that woodpecker's bill would break or get a migraine when it eats, but God designed that woodpecker kind of spring behind their feet. As they drill in a tree, it amazes me. Those birds don't break their necks. How much wood does a woodpecker pack when they go back, 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 back? How much wood does a woodpecker pack when a woodpecker packs on wood? When a woodpecker packs, that woodpecker packs as much wood as it should pack wood. God made the woodpecker on day five. When he finished, he said, it's good. How much wood does a woodpecker pack when a woodpecker packs on wood? That woodpecker sound is like a drum as he thumps against the tree. He blinks his eyes as sawdust flies. He'll never miss a beat. God put a cushion in its head so its brains don't turn to mush. Put sticky stuff on its tongue so it can catch those buck, 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 buck. How much wood does a woodpecker pack when a woodpecker packs on wood? When a woodpecker packs, that woodpecker packs as much wood as it should pack wood. God made the woodpecker on day five. When he finished, he said, it's good. How much wood does a woodpecker pack when a woodpecker packs on wood? When a woodpecker packs, that woodpecker packs as much wood as it should pack wood. Ba -ba -da -da, ba -ba. Thank you. Hey, don't clap and cheer him too much. You'll think that that was good. I appreciate it, guys. There they go again. They're clapping you again. Well, you know what? 
On day six, God made the land animals. And then, you know what the Bible tells us? God made the first man from dust. He didn't make him from an ape man. No, evolution is not true. Man was made from dust. And then God brought the animals he created to Adam, the first man, and asked him to name them. You can imagine giraffe. Well, that's a great name. Well, actually, we don't know what words Adam used. We don't know what language he spoke. But you know why God did that? To show Adam he was alone. There was... Male and female dodo, male and female cat, male and female chimp, where's Mrs. Adam? He didn't look at a female chimp and say, she's close enough, I could date her or something like that. So you know what God did? He put Adam to sleep and from his rib, he made the first woman. So she came from the man, not from an ape woman. See, evolution is not true. Man from dust and woman from his side. And in fact, in the New Testament, we read in Corinthians, that woman was made from man. Of course, that's saying, yes, that history in Genesis is true. Woman came from man. She didn't come from an ape woman. And when God made the first man and woman, you know what it says in the Bible? He made them male and female. In other words, he made two types of humans, male and female. I want us to remember that. God made two types of humans. What were they? Male and female. Isn't it interesting? Mums, dads, and teachers. We have to teach our children that, which is obvious biology, but right from when they're born in this day and age. You know, when he made the first man and woman, he was also making the first marriage. So marriage is one man and one woman. So what's marriage? One man and one woman. We also need to make sure we're teaching about that these days. Remember, God created marriage, not the Supreme Court justices of the United States of America, which is very important for us to understand. Well, here's Adam looking at the animals here, and you say, Mr. Ham, but wait a minute, doesn't that one look like a dinosaur? Are you saying God made dinosaurs on day six? Well, the word dinosaur is a modern word, but you know I'm going to talk about that soon. So there was no word dinosaur back then, but dinosaurs are groups of animals, land animals, that sort of are like reptiles, but instead of having legs out to the side like a crocodile or an alligator, they have their legs underneath more like a horse or a cow or something like that. And there's a number of groups of, of these land animals that later on we call dinosaurs. But yes, God made all the land animals on day six. So what we today call dinosaurs were made on day six alongside Adam. And I can prove it to you as a photograph Eve took in the Garden of Eden. And you can see the Garden of Eden was obviously in Australia, right? And you can imagine headlines in the newspaper. Dinosaurs made on six... Oh, well, actually, it should say what they will call eventually dinosaurs were made on six day. Read all about it. And so here's Adam and Eve and the dinosaurs. And then I have boys and girls say, Mr. Ham, how long ago was that? Well, actually, you can work it out from the Bible. Because God's word tells us he made everything in six days, and there were six ordinary days. And then on day six, he made land animals, and he made the first man, what was his name? Adam. And you know what the Bible does then? God gives us a history and tells us when people were born. For instance... As we go through in the Old Testament there, we read that Adam had a son, Seth, when Adam was 130 years old. Then when Seth was 105 years old, he had a son, Enosh. And then when Enosh was 90 years old, he had a son, Kenan. And then uh, Kenan had a son at, at 70. And, and then he had a son at uh, 65 called Jared. And Jared had a son, Enoch, at 162. And then Methuselah was born when Enoch was 65 years old. And then we keep going on. Methuselah fathered Lamech at 187. Lamech fathered Noah at 182. Then Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, when he was 500. And when you go through and you come to the time of Abraham, from Abraham to when God stepped into history as the babe in a manger, and then up to today, it comes to about 6,000 years. Not millions of years. You don't get millions of years from the Bible. But then I have boys and girls say, well, Mr. Ham, what about, what about the scientists that say millions of years? What do you say to them? Well, you know, in the Bible after the flood of Noah's day, God was teaching a man called Job about creation. And what he was really saying to him was, Job, you weren't there. God was there. So you need to listen to what God has to say. And this is what he said to Job. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? So I want you to remember this. The next time somebody says millions of years ago in a very polite way, you remember what God said to Job and you say, excuse me, were you there? Can you remember that? The next time somebody says millions of years ago, what's the question you ask? Were you there? What is it? 
were you there? Now, I've had boys and girls come back to me and say, well, Mr. Ham, we asked the evolutionists, were you there? And they said, no, we weren't, but you weren't either. What do we say now? Here's what you say. Oh, no, I wasn't there. But I know someone who was, and I have his word. Are you interested? See, let me ask you some questions, and you answer yes or no. Has any human being always been there? No. Does any human being know everything? No. Has any scientist always been there? No. Does any scientist know everything? Who's the only one who's always been there? Who's the only one who knows everything? So who should you always trust first, God or the scientist? Oh, I want you to remember that. Always trust God's word first. Well, you know, uh, buddy, I was looking out here, and these are mainly American boy and girl, boys and girls, and you know how I can tell that? How? I can look at all these boys and girls and say they just don't look as intelligent as Australian boys and girls. What? What are you talking about? Oh, I mean, have a look at the, You must admit, they don't look as intelligent as Australian boys and girls. They look every bit as intelligent to me. Okay, well, all right, I'm going to do a test. This is an intelligence test. In Australia, when I put up pictures of dinosaurs, Within one second, all the boys and girls know the names. I just don't think these are as good as that. Oh, I think they are. I think they oh, are. All right. I'm going to give a test. Are you ready? We're going to do a test here. All right, as soon as I put up the picture of the dinosaur, you yell out the name. We'll see if you're as intelligent as Australian boys and girls. You ready? Here's the first one. Wow. I told you. That was a shock. <laughs> Maybe they are as intelligent as Australian. I mean, I use the same slides, and they got, they got the name straight away. They're good. Uh, wow, how do they do I'm that? I'm not surprised. Oh, you know what? I'm going to verify this. Good scientist. We're going to verify it. I'm going to do another one. As soon as you know the name of this one, yell it out. What's the name of this one? Wow, they were even faster that time. There you go. It's amazing, isn't it? It is. So you really are as intelligent as Australian boys and girls. Wow. Well, I've learned something today. Well, I tell you what. You know, buddy, there's hundreds of names of dinosaurs. Parasaurus, Fuss, Pachycephalosaurus, Struthiomimus, Cytocosaurus, Tanistrophus, Altosaurus, Supersaurus, Brontosaurus, Brachiosaurus, Trans... You know, hundreds. Yeah. Can you say them? No. Okay. I took three days in front of a mirror practicing that. <laughs> I bet you did. So, okay, there's hundreds of names of dinosaurs, but I wonder if the boys and girls know the name of my very favorite dinosaur. Well, Tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to count to three. They can yell out what they think is the name of my favorite dinosaur, and you listen and tell me what, it, what they're saying, okay. and I'll see if it fits with what I've got here. Okay, are you ready? On the count of three. One, two, three. Well, I heard a lot of names, but one louder than the rest of them, that was T-Rex. T-Rex? Yes. That's they what think T-Rex is my favorite dinosaur? That's what seemed to be the winner. Well, actually, this is my favorite dinosaur. Oh, it is T-Rex. Look at that. T-Rex. You know why I like T-Rex? Because I like his teeth. <laughs> Doesn't that look like your parents sometimes when they say, Johnny, have you done those jobs yet? And they smile, and you see T-Rex. Uh, but anyway, then I have boys and girls say, Mr. Ham, Okay, so why don't I find the word dinosaur in the Bible? Well, the same reason you don't find the word email or Xbox in the Bible, right? Because they're modern words. Now, the King James Bible was first translated into English in 1611, but the word dinosaur wasn't invented until 1841. When was the word dinosaur invented? 1841. Okay, I'm going to give them a test. Are you ready? Boys and girls, mums and dads, when was the word dinosaur first invented? 1841. Wow, you have great memories. That's great. So Richard Owen, a famous British scientist, you know, he had discovered some creatures and he had names for them like Megalosaurus. See how they're sort of walking, you know, like a cow or a horse or whatever, and iguanodon. And he realized that these were special types of animals. And so he invented the word dinosaur this way. From two Greek words, dinios and saurus, he invented the word dinosauria, which meant fearfully great lizard, and today we shorten it to dinosaur, which means terrible lizard, that's what we say. And that's one of the reasons why most people think all dinosaurs were great big monsters like T-Rex and so on, because, you know, the word dinosaur, we're told, it means terrible lizard, fearfully great lizard. But we're going to find later on, most dinosaurs are pretty small, really. They were. They were. I mean, the average size, what? between a bison and a, and a sheep right. on the average, but some were small as chickens. Some were as small as chickens and the average size between a bison and a sheep. That's right. And you actually have a fully grown I dinosaur do. here. No, this See, is... if we told people we've got a fully grown dinosaur sculpted here, you'd think we're going to bring out some great big 
yep. sculpture, but actually, what's the name of this one? This is Compsilanathus, and this is full grown. This is a, this is a life-size dinosaur. He wouldn't get much bigger than this if he'd even get bigger at all. So we want people to understand not all dinosaurs were big. Not all were big. Some got to be giants, but most were not big. In between a sheep and a bison, some as small as chicken, some smaller than this one, in fact. Full grown. So, so buddy, okay, you know what my favorite dinosaur uh, is? So do you have a favorite dinosaur? Well, there's, there's several dinosaurs that I like, Ken, that I, that I can name. But you know what? I, I don't believe, personally, I don't believe that all dinosaurs are extinct. Really? I, I think that there, there's at least one that's on the verge of extinction, yeah. but, I, I, but it's just on the verge of extinction. I got a picture of it. You got would a picture you, of it? Okay. I do. Would you, like, would you guys like to see it? All right. Wow. Okay, stand a picture of a, here. A picture so of a living dinosaur yeah, on the verge of extinction. Yeah, this what can be to hard do? to see. It can be oh. hard to see. Well, what are you get doing right up here. Okay. Yeah. What, what is this? Can you get right like this right here? Uh, on the verge uh, of extinction. Uh oh. <laughs> you think you're funny, don't you? <laughs> okay, buddy. All right. I, I get it. All right, so do you really have a favorite dinosaur? Well, yes, I, I do, Ken. Can you guess what it is? Well, if I was to guess, I'd think it'd be this one. You're right. Uh, See, uh, there it is again. I yeah. guessed again. Well, you know me pretty well, don't you? Yeah, well, that's we've true. been together. What, we've done this talk before. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, a, a, in fact, uh, I was watching a television program. That's why I, one of the reasons I like this dinosaur. It showed a scientist, a paleontologist, that looked at the head of this dinosaur. There you go. Yep, you, you got the right one on there, Ken. Good job. And he said, I'm going to cut that skull in two of the fossilized skull of Parasaurolophus. That's what this dinosaur is called. And when he split the skull in two, he saw that it was hollow on the inside, like you see here, kind of like tubes. And this scientist thought, well, I wonder what that was for. What, what was uh -huh. it designed like that for? So he made an instrument. He thought maybe it would blow air out of its lungs and it would resonate through this big tube that's on its head and it would make a sound so it could communicate with other members of the dinosaur herd. So the scientist says, I'm going to make an instrument like that, and he made an instrument. It was just his idea. He didn't know for sure, but he just wanted to see if this would even work. And so for the first time in my life when he blew on this instrument, I heard what this animal at least may have sounded like when it was alive. And I thought, that's just more than cool. Well, wait a minute. Were you there? I, I was not there. Uh, and so the you didn't hear the dinosaur? No, no but, but the scientists just wanted to see if this was an experiment, Ken. He okay. just wanted to see if, right. this, if this might work. Okay. So, uh, so he made that instrument, and I, I watched this really closely. I thought, well, I can make an instrument just like that. And so I did, I did. And I brought it with me to play it for you guys if you want to hear what this animal at least may have sounded like. Would you like to hear it? Yeah. All right. So you actually made an instrument. Wow. I did. So you're going to let us hear what Parasaurolophus, Parasaurolophus may have, we're not sure, probably, yep. perhaps, yep. but who knows, we don't really know, we weren't there, it's not here today, we don't know for sure, perhaps it did sound like this, but we don't really know it did sound like that, and if it was here, perhaps it would have sounded like that, but we don't really know. You sound like a politician. <laughs> I've been watching them on TV lately. <laughs> you're getting good at it. Yeah, so I've been learning from them. All right, here we go what this animal at least may have sounded like. Before I do it, you see uh, this part right here? That would be the tube that's on its head. Just thought I ought to tell you guys that. All yeah, right, so All right. Glad here, here we go. So glad you did. You ready? You ready? No, oh, here we go. You see this part right here? That would be the end of its nose. I just thought I ought to tell you that. Yeah. Okay, you ready? Oh, I'm gonna sit down. You see this part right here? That represents its throat, where it blow the air out of its lungs and it resonates through here. Just thought I ought to tell you that. Thank you. You ready? Here we go, here we go. Uh. I got an idea. Let's do this on the count of three. Ken, can oh. you count to three? Okay. Yeah, I can count to three. So on the count of three, we're going to... That, that doesn't sound right. On the count of three, count to three. Tell what we'll do. On the count of three, let's start at three and go backwards. That'll really confuse Buddy. Why are you, you doing understand this that? Me? On the count of three, we say three, two, one. You're making this okay. confusing. All right. You ready? One, two, three. Three, two, one.
Don't clap him, that was embarrassing. Now you're gonna tell me you studied dinosaur hips or something? Well, I heard you say that dinosaurs walked with their legs directly under them like this, not sprawl legged like uh -huh. an alligator or cr cr like a, a crocodile. I think the reason God did that with dinosaurs was that they could do this. Buddy, please sit down. Don't encourage him. All right, let's go on here. So, if the word dinosaur wasn't invented until 1841, I wonder what dinosaurs were called before they were called dinosaurs. Hmm. You know, out here we have Noah's Ark. And on the third deck, we actually have an exhibit about flood legends. There are flood legends and cultures all around the world that sort of sound like Genesis, but they're different, but they sort of sound similar in some ways. And that's because as people moved away from the Tower of Babel, they took the account of the flood with them, which was a real event, and changed it into a sort of a story. But the real record that's never changed is in the Bible. But those legends have a basis in a real event. Well, you know what? There are legends all over the world. Can anyone tell me what sort of legends you might, uh, I might be thinking about? I mean, what is this one here? This is a dragon that Buddy has sculpted. And the Chinese talk about dragons. And on the flag of Wales, the country of Wales, uh, we actually see a dragon. I was over in Wales and bought one of their flags. As you can see there, you can see the dragon. And all across Europe, United Kingdom, you find sculptured heads of dragons and you find sculptures of St. George and the dragon. I'm sure we've all heard of that. And so we believe that all these dragon legends, like flood legends, have a basis in something that's true. We think that perhaps some of these dragons might have been what we call dinosaurs today because their descriptions sort of fit that. And you know what else, buddy? There's, it's interesting, there are actually legends of fire-breathing dragons. Do you, do you think there could be fire-breathing dragons? I, I, yes, I do. I, I, I believe that there could be, and I think that some of the fire-breathing dragons be uh, what we call dinosaurs today. Now, I don't think all dinosaurs went around doing that, but I think there's a few that could. That Well, you know, it's possible because Leviathan in the Bible in Job 41 is a sea creature, but it breathed fire, It did. the Bible says. Now, dinosaurs were land animals, not sea creatures. But think about this. There's a little lightning bug, which of course, you know, when you watch programs like this, I'll tell you it evolved. How could, a, how could a little creature like that evolve? Look at that, it was obviously created to do that, to light itself up. Or what about the eel? If you go to the Tennessee Aquarium, they have an electric eel that actually lights up lights on a Christmas tree. And of course, I'll tell you that evolved over millions of years. Not at all, it was obviously created that way. And then of course, there's the bombardier beetle when it doesn't like a little creature around it, uh, it actually blasts out fiery gases. Hot 212 degrees. 212 degrees. Can you imagine it evolving and blowing itself up till it learned how to do that? Wouldn't make any sense, would it? It burns spiders, hey, toads, snakes, and anything then, wants to eat it. There are jellyfish. There's no way these could evolve like this. Look how beautiful they are. Obviously God created them. But when you have bugs that light themselves up or blow out hot gases or electric gills and these beautiful, beautiful jellyfish like that, maybe there could have been fire-breathing dragons. You know, I was in South America uh, a uh -huh. few months ago, and I like to go and visit pet stores. I went to this one pet store, it was really interesting, because I was looking at some of the lizards and snakes, and, uh, and, and he had a, a sign by this one little cage that said, fire-breathing dragon. So I called the owner of the pet store over to me and said, well, what's this all about? He laughed. He said, well, some of my employees, he says, they go out in the jungle. He says, they catch some of the lizards and snakes that we sell here in the pet store. He says, when they caught this one, he says, we don't know what species it is. He says, we're still trying to research and find out what it is. He says, but they said it was a fire-breathing dragon. He laughed and he says, I know they were just teasing me about this. And uh, he said, but I thought it wouldn't maybe help us to make this, this little lizard, since we don't know what it is, more interesting to people who come to visit us uh, if we just named it Fire Breathing Dragon. I said, it's interesting you say that because in the United States, I go all over the country and I tell people about God's creation and about some of the dinosaurs and the dragon legends. I said, since I do that, would you sell it to me? And he did, he sold it to me. Don't tell me you, you bought it? I, I bought it and I brought it with me today to, to to show the folks, yep. it can't it can't breathe far. But I thought you you would be interested just for the namesake. Would you like this, to see it? Is that what this cage is here? I don't don't sound like you do. You really want to see it? All right. Is that what this cage is? It's in there. Yes. It is in here. No, no. be be careful of it. Oh, wow. Now that's now, a, now this is a savage looking thing. Now he's just a baby. He'll probably grow up to be about 12 feet, but he's just a little. 
Now, bit. when I do get him out, since he's not tame yet, be real quiet, because I don't want to get bit any worse than anybody else. Ooh, I don't want to get clawed. That thing is savage. Oh, get his wife. He's not all that. Okay. He's taming he, down. He, 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 he'll, he'll be it. all right. I'd like to put him in a... Look how it's opening the, its mouth, though. I'd like to put him in the museum when I get him tamed down. Oh, yeah, let me put that cage just, down. There he goes, yeah. There's nothing, now, they call that a fire-breathing dragon. Yeah, the fire, it's, 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 that's what they named it. Yeah, really? Easy, easy, you're all right. Ouch. Bit me. <coughs> hey, get that thing away from me. <laughs> I think that singed my hair. I didn't know it could do that. Oh, it's not real. I'm just teasing you guys. It's not real. Just having fun with you. Well, come on, I deserve a hand out of that. Before we go on, in case there are any animal rights activists in the room, no animals were harmed in that demonstration. <laughs> I just thought it, I, it was not real. No. I better tell them that. We're safe, Ken. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well. All right, so let's go on here. Boy, he's full of surprises, isn't he? So, we're all dinosaurs, monsters. Now, remember we said uh, some dinosaurs were as small as chickens. If they'd have survived to today, we would have had Kentucky Fried Dinosaur instead of Kentucky Fried Chicken, wouldn't we? <laughs> Actually, do you know when evolutionists are eating chicken, they think they're eating dinosaur? Because they believe dinosaurs evolved into birds, which is absolutely absurd. Uh, they certainly didn't evolve into birds. But then I have boys and girls say, Mr. Ham, now you're telling me that T-Rex with all those sharp teeth live beside Adam. Yes, wouldn't Adam have been a little worried when T-Rex was considering lunch? Maybe Adam for lunch? No, because originally all the animals, and Adam and Eve, were vegetarian. Because we come to the second age of dinosaurs, which is what? Fearless. Do you know what we read in the Bible? In Genesis chapter 1, verse 29, God told Adam and Eve to eat fruit, and in verse 30, he said, the animals ate plants. And so the diet of people and animals, originally of the first two people, Adam and Eve, was like this. Wow. See, it was a different world. Animals didn't eat animals back then. People didn't eat animals. There was no disease in the world. There was no death. Do you know what God said after he made everything? He said everything he made was what? Very good. Everything was very good. And so here's Adam and Eve and the animals all living happily together. And then I had boys and girls saying, hey, Mr. Ham, we were here at the Ark Encounter and we had a hot dog. You sell these wonderful beef hot dogs over here. If we were vegetarian, how could we have a hot dog? Oh, well, that's easy to understand, because after the flood, in Genesis 9, verse 3, God said, just as I gave you the plants originally to eat, now I give you everything. And everything is a word that's translated today, hot dog. And so <laughs> we can now eat everything. By the way, I love the hot dogs I have here. All I do is quote Genesis 9, 3, pray extra hard and go for it. That's what I encourage you uh, to do. But we're allowed to eat meat today because things have changed. But then boys and girls say, but now wait a minute, if T-Rex was vegetarian originally, he has really sharp teeth. In fact, buddy, you have a model of a T-Rex tooth there. I do, yes. If you wanna come and show them. How many of these teeth did a T-Rex have? T-Rex had between 50 to 60 teeth in his 50 mouth. 50 to 60 And this teeth is like just that. an average tooth. They got yep. to be a lot bigger than this. This part is not the tooth, this is just the root. So if he had opened his mouth, you'd see this part right here. Now, if T-Rex would lose a tooth, Ken, yep. another one would grow in. If he'd lose that tooth, another one would grow in. If he'd lose that tooth, another one would grow in. We could go on and on with this. So T-Rex kept growing teeth its entire well, life. A lot of reptiles do, not just But you know what, a lot of boys and girls look at that and say, a mouthful of teeth like that, it's obviously a meat eater, well, we want you to understand this. Just because an animal has sharp teeth doesn't mean it was a meat eater, it just means it had what? Sharp teeth, exactly. And you need sharp teeth, you're gonna eat all sorts of fruits and plants. In fact, see this skull? That skull, oh, you look at that and say, that was a savage creature, what did it eat? Actually, it belongs to a giant panda that eats mainly bamboo. Or well, what about this one? That's a ferocious looking creature, you think that must rip into animals, actually, it goes around Australia and rips into fruit. It's a fruit bat. Right. And this monkey from South America, you say, what does it eat? You might look at it and say anything it wants. Actually, it's a vegetarian. In fact, buddy, okay, but what about, what about bears? Yes. I mean, when you look, at, you look at them, they look like they've got these savage teeth. Are we saying that they were vegetarian originally? Originally, yes. In fact, bears still are vegetarian for the most part, even are today. They really? So I have two, these are castings off of the real animal. This is a lion, African a lion, African lion now, and this, they are meat eaters. This is a skull of a bear, so you have the jaw of a bear there. Yeah, this, 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 is, okay. this is a grizzly bear jaw. Now we know a lion today eats meat, right? Yep. 
and this is a grizzly bear, but bears are mainly vegetarian. Six feet apart, Ken, don't forget that. <laughs> and bears, bears will eat meat. Nobody uh, in the future will understand what that meant. They, they, will, uh, they will eat I'm meat. I'm trying to show boys and girls that this was a savage meat eater. It's hard to work with him. You know, you know what? Bears will eat meat. <laughs> Okay, okay, all right, get on with your point. What were you saying? All right, you, you made me lose my thought. Bears will eat meat, but they're mainly vegetarian. In fact, when a bear comes out of hibernation in the springtime, they spend about two weeks just eating grass. What, what's this bear got in his mouth? Yeah. So whether it was a lion, well, you know, the cat kind, or bear kind, just because an animal has sharp teeth today doesn't mean it was a meat eater always. It just means it just has what? Sharp, sharp teeth. Sharp teeth. Yes, that's okay. right. So, originally, animals didn't eat animals, but they do today. And we say, something must have changed. Well, now we come to the third age, which is what? Fallen. We live in a world today where we see death in the world and disease. See, originally there was no death. Animals only ate plants. Adam and Eve ate plants. Now we see animals eating other animals. So we have to ask a question. What happened? Let's ask that question. What happened? Let's ask it again. What happened? And I'm going to illustrate this in a very special way. Here is a picture of Buddy Davis as a little boy. And there's Buddy Davis today. Here's a picture of Buddy Davis as a teenager. And there's Buddy Davis today. So let's all ask the question. What happened? What happened to Buddy Davis? Boys and girls, I'm sorry to have to tell you this. Take one look. Sin has affected Buddy Davis. <laughs> In fact, I can show you sin affected the top of his head. That's true. Look. Ken. What? This is a solar panel for adventure. <laughs> You're encouraging him. You know what this is? Hair. Okay, let's go on here. So what happened? You know, when God made Adam and Eve and the animals and so on, he also made a garden. And in that garden, he put two special trees, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he put Adam and Eve in the garden. He said, Adam, you can eat of all the trees. There's one tree you're not to eat of, because if you do, you'll surely die. Well, we know Adam ate the fruit, and that's how sin came into the world. I've had boys and girls say to me, Mr. Ham, why did God even let Adam choose like that? I mean... You know, look what happened. Now there's death in the world and everything changed. Well, to help you understand, I would say this. God didn't make Adam to be like a puppet. You know, you know what a puppet is? You know, Buddy has some puppets of dinosaurs. You can put them on your hand here. He made these puppets, actually, and he can make them do whatever he wants them to do. He can make them open their mouths. He can make them move around, move sideways. See, God didn't make Adam like a puppet to force him to love him. God wanted us in Adam to love God because we wanted to. So there you are. You know what, buddy? What? Remember T-Rex is my favorite dinosaur? Yes. And I have a T-Rex. Okay. And I can deal with those two. Okay. There it is. <laughs> T-Rex. See, they're frightened. Look, they're, they're down there now. They're frightened. You can put it away, Ken. Okay. <laughs> All right, so God didn't make Adam to be like a puppet. Then what happened? The devil in the form of a serpent came to the first woman, Eve, and said, you can eat the fruit. You don't need to believe God's word. Adam was standing right there with her. You know what he should have said? Eve, no, we're not going to do that because that would disobey God. You know what he did? He took the fruit and ate it, and he rebelled against God in doing that, and that's called S-I-N. What's that word? Sin. And because of sin, what came into the world? Death. Now it was a whole different world. Adam and Eve knew something was wrong, and they tried to make clothes for themselves out of leaves. But you know what God did? God made clothes for Adam and Eve out of garments of skins, which means he must have killed animals to do that. Hmm, why did he do that? Well, at the Creation Museum, if you've been through the Creation Museum, here remember seeing this exhibit here. It's in the Cave of Sorrows, yes. And that exhibit, that's the first death, actually, and it's the first blood sacrifice is a covering for their sin, a picture of what was to come in Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God 
who takes away the sin of the world. You've heard of the Israelites sacrificing animals over and over again. You see, because of sin, what did God say? You will die. Your bodies will die. But we're made in the image of God, so the real us lives inside our bodies, and we're going to live forever, but we'd be separated from God forever. God doesn't want that. He wants us to live forever with him. But we can't as sinners because he's pure and perfect and holy. So someone needs to pay the penalty for sin so we can go back to be with God. And you know what God was saying here? One day someone will come to pay the penalty for sin. And who can tell me who that one is? Jesus. Because we learn that he came as a babe in a manger to die on a cross and be raised from the dead and offers a free gift of salvation. You see, none of us could pay for sin because we're sinners. We needed a perfect man and God stepped into history to be the perfect man, the God-man Jesus. Wow. But you know what? There are many Christians that say, well, death has always been here. What do you mean? Well, they believe in millions of years. You see, if you're a Christian and you believe in millions of years, you've got a big problem. Because the Bible makes it clear death came after Adam's sin. If you believe in millions of years, that came from people who didn't believe in God, who said, we want to explain the fossil record without God. And they said the fossils were laid down millions of years before man. And they said millions of years, the Christians said, we can take the millions of years and say that existed before Adam. Well, wait a minute. In the fossil record... You've got evidence of animals eating each other and bones in their stomachs. But originally, Adam and Eve and the animals are all vegetarian. So that couldn't have happened millions of years before Adam. Not only that, in the fossil record, there's all sorts of diseases in the bones, like cancer, in dinosaur bones. But wait a minute, after God made Adam and Eve and everything else, he said everything he made was what? Very good. So you can't have dead dinosaurs with diseases like cancer before Adam not at all, not before Adam sinned, which means the millions of years can't be true. And it can't be. It's not. And you can imagine now the headlines in the newspaper, Adam sends the world's in chaos. Because of sin, now there's death in the world. Everyone is going to die because of sin. But God has provided a way for us to live with him forever. You know what it says in the New Testament? The whole creation groans because of sin. And it does. It groans diseases. When you get sick, it's groaning because of sin. See, the world we see today, you know what, boys and girls? That's not the world as God made it. He made a perfect world. Our sin messed it all up. And so we're living in a groaning world today. And you know, when Adam and Eve sinned, God said, you can't eat of the tree of life and live forever in your sinful state. So he sent them out of the garden and put angels to guard the way back so they couldn't get back into the garden to eat the tree of life. And so that they would have to die so that we could then go to be with Jesus forever if we put our faith and trust in him. And then he said thorns and thistles are now going to be there for us. Uh, it's going to be a different world. It's going to be a hard world. Actually, thorns came after the curse. You know, there are fossil thorns in the fossil record that evolutionists say are millions of years old, but they can't be because thorns didn't come until after Adam sinned, until after God judged sin. And then God said, instead of just getting your food in the garden, now you're going to have to work hard. And so we're going to have to work hard to get our food. And it is hard because the ground is cursed and there are weeds and there are pests. It's a fallen world. Our sin messed it all up. In fact, who's ever pulled weeds from the garden with their parents? Have you done that? The next time you're doing that, just remember you do this. You say, I have sinned, I have sinned. Well, just to remind you, that's because of sin that we have all these weeds and pests now. And then animals started changing their diet and started even eating each other. And sin was so bad that in the first generation of children, Cain killed his brother Abel. That's how bad sin is. And about 1,700 years later, by the time of a man called Noah, the world had become so wicked. Everyone had rebelled against God except for Noah and his family. And God said, enough, I'm going to judge the wickedness of man with a flood. So what's the next age of dinosaurs? Flood. And God said, Noah, I want you to build a great big ship, just like this big ship just outside here. Massive ship. 300 cubits long. A cubit is from the tip of your fingers to your elbow here. And we've done research on, on what cubit we believe we should use for this. And it works out that ship is, 100, is 510 feet long, about one and a half times the length of a football field, half the width of a football field. And it's built 15 feet off the ground, seven stories high, 10 stories high at the bow, 3.3 million board feet of timber. It is an enormous ship, isn't it? As you look 
at uh, the Noah's Ark that we have built. And then I have boys and girls say, Mr. Ham, now, God told Noah to build it out of gopher wood. Did you build it out of gopher wood? My answer is yes, we did, actually. We had to go for a lot of wood. <laughs> so we built it out of gopher wood. Actually, we don't know what gopher wood was at all. And then, you know, as people watch this and see that it's an enormous ship, you realize how big it was. Wow. And then God said, I'm going to send to you two of every, seven pairs of some, but two of every kind of land-dwelling, air-breathing animal to go on board the ark. Well, what does kind mean? Well, the Bible tells us God made kinds of land animals according to their kind, and that means that each kind must produce its own kind. So horses would produce horses, even though you can have zebras and donkeys and a zorse and a zonkey like we have at the Ark and the Creation Museum, they're still horses. And then dogs produce dogs, even though they have dingoes and wolves and so on, but they're all still dogs. And cats would produce cats. So every kind of land-dwelling, air-breathing animal was to go on board Noah's Ark, two of each of the unclean kinds and seven pairs of the clean. And of course, I have boys and girls say, but Mr. Ham, dinosaurs couldn't fit on board. They were too big. But remember, many dinosaurs were very small. Now, some were very big, like your big sauropods. But dinosaurs hatched out of eggs, and the biggest egg we found is about the size of a football. This dinosaur is about the size of a mouse when it hatched out of an egg, a mustasaurus. We have real fossil eggs at the Creation Museum on display. If you've seen, who's seen the dinosaurs at the Creation Museum? All right, lots of hands. Did you know Buddy sculpted those? He sculpted that dragon over here too. So those dinosaurs are on display there, and we have some fossil eggs there, and we have this one there. That's a T-Rex egg, and Buddy has built a model of it here to show you the size. We couldn't bring the real egg because it's too fragile, but I do have a real dinosaur egg here. This is a fossil Dinosaur. What sort of dinosaur is that? That would be that would be a hadosaur egg. That's a duck-billed dinosaur egg. That's the actual fossil one. How do you know it's 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 a hadosaur? It's very rare you can do this, but sometimes you can do what's called a CAT scan, where you can take a uh -huh. picture of the image of the embryo that's developing inside of these eggs, and it's a type of dinosaur that would grow up to be a hadosaur, duck-billed dinosaur. See, that's Hatching, not a very big egg, is it? No, and some hadosaurs got to be about 40 feet long. Wow, they hatched out of this and got to be 40 yeah, feet. Yeah, and, this, and is, this is a T-Rex egg for the same reason. People say, well, how do you know it's a T-Rex egg? Because they do a CAT scan, and you can see the embryo developing inside. And it appears to be the type of dinosaur when it be an adult would be one like a, a Tyrannosaurus rex. Now, yeah. I need to ask you some questions in front of all the boys and girls and mums and dads here. Okay. Okay. So, number one, okay, you can answer these questions. Okay. Is it true you're older than 130 years old? Get out of here, Ken. Oh, no, that wasn't one of the questions. Okay, so six feet. All right, so are you saying Noah took eggs on the ark? I didn't say that, no. Okay, are you saying Noah took babies on the ark? Nope, I don't believe Okay, so what are we saying? We're saying that uh, even big dinosaurs had to be small dinosaurs uh -huh. once. It would have made sense for Noah to have taken younger animals, old enough to reproduce, uh -huh. but not as big as some of the animals. So in other words, the big sauropods, young adults, probably were more likely what he took anyway, even though there's plenty of room on the ark. There's plenty of room to take the big ones. What would made more sense to take a, a, an average-sized dinosaur. They've been easier to care for on the ark, and they would have lived longer to reproduce after the flood so was over. So we need to understand all dinosaurs were small and grew up, you know, and yeah. to various sizes. Remember when you and your wife Kay and I and my wife uh, were in Australia and I took you to a crocodile farm and I said, buddy, would you hold the eggs of a crocodile? And he did. Sure. Then I said, would you hold a baby crocodile? And it he was did. fun. It was fun. And I then liked. I said, would you hold a mother crocodile? And no, you did not. No way was I going to do that. No. Because there'd be no Buddy Davis if you did. No, no. But, but there's a good point to make here. A, a crocodile grows to be about 20 feet long. That's only 20 feet. A T-Rex only had to grow another 20 feet on top of that. Uh -huh. So if a crocodile can hatch out of an egg about this big, it makes sense how a T-Rex could uh, hatch out of an egg this big and just grow to be 20 feet longer than what a, what a crocodile would. So here are the animals going on the ark, and there's a big sauropod, but it makes more sense that young adults would have gone on for those. Most dinosaurs weren't that big anyway. And so each kind of land-dwelling, air-breathing animal went on board the ark. So the horse kind, two horses, the dog kind, two dogs, the cat kind, two cats. For dinosaurs, there was more than just one kind of dinosaur. Actually, there were about 80 different kinds of what we call dinosaurs. And Buddy, you have a teaching song. I do. That actually teaches about kinds. And we'll ask 
uh, Southern Salvation, our resident music artist here, to come out, and they'll help sing the chorus here. Sing along, and you'll get to learn about kinds from a song. Yeah, this be a lot of fun. All right, here we go. Ooh. Professor said evolution's true. Look at all the dogs now, there's your proof. I said, sir, they're still canines. They never change to another kind. Well, a dog is a dog and a cat is a cat. A horse is a horse and a bat is a bat. Never will a gnat turn into a rat. Not gonna happen, that's a fact. Cause a kind is a kind and it stays a kind. Kind never kind of evolved from slime. Time after time, if you check, you'll find. Kind is a kind and it stays a kind. A deer is a deer and a bear is a bear. There's no evolution going on there. There's a lot of variety in God's design, but everything stays within its kind. Well, a dog is a dog and a cat is a cat. A horse is a horse and a bat is a bat. Never will a gnat turn into a rat. Not gonna happen, that's a fact. Cause a kind is a kind and it stays a kind. Kind never kind of evolved from slime. Time after time, if you check, you'll find. Kind is a kind and it stays a kind. Kind and a family are the same. There's lots of species within that range. Poodle and wolf and a great dame. There's still dogs they haven't changed. Well, a dog is a dog and a cat is a cat. A horse is a horse and a bat is a bat. Never will a gnat turn into a rat. It's not gonna happen, that's a fact. Cause a kind is a kind and stays a kind. Kind is a kind of evolved from slime. Time after time, if you check, you'll find Kind is a kind and it stays a kind A little bit of picking here Where's all my hang clappers? See if you can outcrowd us Well, a dog is a dog and a cat is a cat A horse is a horse and a bat is a bat Never will a gnat turn into a rat Not gonna happen, that's a fact Cause a kind is a kind and it stays a kind Kind never kind of evolved from slime Time after time, if you check, you'll find Kind is a kind and it stays a kind Oh, they didn't clap a lot that time, those who didn't <laughs> like that I think they did just fine You think so? I do, I do Did you like that? So oh, okay, huh. all right well, here the animals going on board the ark, and you see them going inside, and you know what? I have to tell you something. I have seen churches where on kindergarten walls they have Noah's ark looking like a bathtub ark with drafts sticking out the chimney about to sink at any moment. Who's seen arks like that? Oh. And in children's books, the real ark looked like this, the one that's just outside the building here. And you know, on the second deck, we have an exhibit about fairy tale arcs where we warn people, hey, they may be cute, but do you know what the atheists say? Noah couldn't get all the animals on the ark, and they use that to try to capture your children away from believing in God and the Bible. And that's why we have a sign there uh, that says, imagine the devil saying, if I can convince you or your children that the flood wasn't real, I can convince you that heaven and hell are not real. And you see, if you look at those two illustrations there, the real ark look like the one on the left, the one on the right, there's no way the animals could fit on that. Why is it we have those sort of arcs in our children's books and in our churches? I hate those bathtub arcs. I hate them so much, we're going to sink the bathtub ark. You want to help me sink the bathtub ark? Once and for all, we're going to sink the bathtub ark. Okay, we're going to do a practice here. On the count of three, I want you to put your hands in the air and go, yay. You ready? One, two, three. Yay. Okay. So on the count of three, we're going to sink the bathtub ark, bringing in the real ark. Are you ready? On the count of three. One, two, three. Yay! You know what? I so hate those bathtub arcs. We're going to sink it one more time, just to make sure we sunk it. Okay, you ready? On the count of one, two, three. Yay! Good. We got rid of the bathtub ark. And you know what else? Noah's ark is a picture of Jesus. Do you know God told Noah, put one door in the ark, only one, there's only one door in this big ark out here. Jesus said, I am the door, if anyone enters by me, if you put your trust in Jesus, he will be saved. And at night time here, we have the ark lit up in different colors, but we have the door lit up as a cross. Well, 
It has to be dark for you to see that, but on the inside, we have a lit cross on that big door. And I love to see mums and dads and boys and girls all getting their photographs there to remind everyone that as Noah and his family went through a door to be saved, we need to go through a door, and that door is the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you imagine 4,300 years ago, round about, the ark was fully loaded. Noah and his family are on the ark, the animals are on board, and the door was open. And there could have been millions of people, and they'd all rebelled against God except Noah and his family. And I could imagine them saying, silly old Noah, there's not going to be a flood. We don't believe there's God. We, we don't trust in God like many people are doing today in our culture and scoffing at people who believe in God. And then you know what happened? Can you imagine as they were watching this and then suddenly the Bible says, God shut the door. And that door started to swing closed. And then you could imagine the thump as it closed. And then the fountains of the great deep broke open and waters burst forth and covered the earth in water and only those people and the animal kinds, the land animal kinds on the ark were saved. Those outside were drowned, covered in mud and turned into fossils. Actually, if there really was a global flood, we'd expect to find billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. And what do we find? Let's say it together. Billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. Well, one more teaching song for this program. This is Buddy's last teaching song, and he actually has a song about billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. You know, when our children were small, before they were married and had their children, they used to want to put Buddy Davis songs on, and I'd hear billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. When I went to bed at night, I heard billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. When I woke up in the morning, I had a headache hearing billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. I got so sick of listening to Buddy Davis. No, I didn't really. But you know, our children now are playing, guess what they're playing to our grandchildren? Billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid This is Buddy, I think it's his signature song, actually. He's got many, many songs, but this is one people just love and they sing it all over the world. Uh, why don't you sing it? And uh, Steve Hess and Southern Salvation will sing along as well to help all of us sing. Here we go. The Bible talks about a worldwide flood, of a worldwide flood, of a worldwide flood. If there really was a worldwide flood, what would the evidence be? Billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. Billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. Well, there really was a worldwide flood. Just look at Stony Curse with billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. The Bible talks about Noah and the ark and a worldwide flood where the world was judged. If there really was a worldwide flood, what would the evidence be? Sing it out. Billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. Billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. Well, there really was a worldwide flood. Just look at the stony curse. With billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. Well, I got an idea. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. No, I really got an idea. All right, buddy. What is your idea? Here's my idea on this last course. Need everybody to clap your hands. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. Yep, I got you in time. That's pretty important. Here's the rest of my idea. I'm going to see if you guys can outdrown me singing. I don't think you can outdrown me. I have the microphone. This is a challenge for y'all. Let's see if we can make them hear us where the ark is at. You're going to have to sing loud to beat me. Keep those hands going. Nice and loud. Here we go. Ready? Billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. I'm winning. Billions of dead things buried in 
rock layers laid down the water all over the earth. Well, there really was a worldwide flood. Just look at Stony Curse. With billions of dead things buried, the rock layers laid down the water all over the earth. I think you beat me. Well, you know what? That fits with the fact that death came after sin. You can't have millions of years of death and disease before sin. But then I have boys and girls say, but Mr. Ham, doesn't it take millions of years to make a fossil? No, it doesn't. Imagine if you wanted to make a cat fossil. Now, the reason I use cats is because I don't like cats. <laughs> Does anyone here have a pet cat? Oh. Oh, okay. All right, I'll admit it. I actually have a pet cat. He has a name. His name is Earl. And I have him here with me, under the podium. <laughs> Earl the dead cat. That is the best looking cat you could ever have. <laughs> Imagine you go home and you find out that your pet cat, your pet cat looks like Earl. Mum and Dad, I don't want to lose Earl. I know what I'll do, I'll fossilize him. So you take him outside, put him on the yard, and you put some signs there, dead cat, fossilizing, do not touch. And then like a good student, you start taking notes. Day one, dead cat on grass. Day seven, smelly dead cat on grass. Day 20, smelly dead cat on grass with parts missing. Day 30, where is my cat? It didn't turn into a fossil. Buddy, you live in a 160-year-old log cabin and you have woods all around it, yep. and when a deer dies, it doesn't turn into a fossil. No, in fact, in about two weeks, uh, if, if the weather is warm in the summer months, in about two weeks, that animal is mainly gone. So it decays, other animals eat it. Yes. And then it's gone. Yep. So to make a fossil, you've got to cover something really quickly and preserve it. But to make billions of fossils all over the earth, you'd have to cover it quickly with a massive amount of water and a massive amount of mud, which sounds like what? The flood. And you know what else? We believe most of your fossils come from the flood, but you know what? Evolutionists say, oh no, those fossils are millions of years old. In fact, they almost make it sound like they dig up a fossil bone and has a label saying 65 million years. Do you think it has a label when you dig it up? No. If it did have a label, I'll tell you what it would say, because Noah's flood was about 4,300 years ago, so most fossils would be 4,300 years old, not millions of years. Well, the ark lands after the flood. The animals come out. Dinosaurs lined up to have their photographs taken. Like typical Americans, they sold t-shirts. I survived the flood. And then they started to move out over the earth and the dog kind came out and produced lots of dogs that eventually formed all your different species of dogs, but they're still dogs. And the cats formed different species of cats, but they're still cats. And horses formed different species of horses, but they're still horses. And each dinosaur kind formed different species within the dinosaur kinds. And here's the animals coming out. And Noah and his wife and their three sons and their wives came out. You know what the Bible tells us? Even in the New Testament, it says only eight persons survived the flood. That's right, the eight that were on the ark. And the three sons, look what it says in Genesis 9, the three sons of Noah, from these three sons, people of the whole earth were dispersed. We all go back to Noah's three sons, and back to Noah, then back to Adam and Eve. But about 150 years after the flood, as people increased on the earth, they rebelled against God again, and they built a tower to worship the heavens instead of worshiping God, and God gave them different languages, and you can read about that in Genesis chapter 10, and they moved away from each other and formed different people groups. Not races, there's only one race, because we all go back to Noah's three sons and back to... Adam and Eve. So there's only one race of people, not different races. And then I have boys and girls say, Mr. Ham, is there anything in the Bible that could show you that dinosaurs lived after the flood? Oh, I think there is. I think there's a dinosaur described in detail in the Bible. I do. It's called Behemoth. In Job 40, verse 15, God was talking to Job and he said, Job, this great animal, power in his stomach muscles, his ribs are like bars of iron. He's the first of the ways of God, which seems to say the largest land animal God made. He moves his tail like a cedar. You can imagine a big cedar tree swaying in the wind. He moves his tail like a cedar. You know what's interesting? In some, in some study Bibles where people write notes, they, they make some stupid comments at times. 
For instance, in the NIV study Bible, someone put, this is possibly a hippopotamus or an elephant. That does not make sense. I spent years researching the rear ends of elephants and hippos to try to figure out if it really was behemoth or not. Moves its tail like a cedar. Here's my research on elephants. Behold, behemoth. He moves his tail like a cedar. That looks like a bit of rope hanging in the wind. I don't think it was an elephant. Must be a hippo. Behold, behemoth. He moves his tail like a cedar. Look at that. That reminds me of a cedar tree. Some people think I'm weird. Who collects photographs of rear ends of elephants and hippos? It's for teaching purposes to help you understand. There's no way I believe behemoth could have been an elephant or a hippo. It doesn't, a tail like, you know, a, that moves like a cedar wouldn't fit an elephant or it wouldn't fit a hippo. I think it would fit more of a creature like that. Not that. I think Job might have seen a big sauropod dinosaur. That's the largest land animal we know existed from the bones we found so far. And you know what's interesting? Evolutionists believe that dinosaurs lived millions of years ago and didn't live beside people. And yet, here's the interesting thing. This is an evolutionist book that says there's a petroglyph in Indian carving in National Bridges National Monument in Utah that bears striking resemblance to a what? Dinosaur? Well, we sent Buddy out there and he got photographs of the carving. Look at that. Can you see that there? And he actually got a wax cloth impression of the actual carving. And this is the actual size and if you ask boys and girls, what does that look like? What would you say that looks like? Dinosaur. Now, if you ask the park ranger, what does he say? They'd say it's a mythical creature, Ken. But, you know, there's a point to make. Right above this would be another pictograph of uh, yeah. carving. And uh, it might be a bird. And you ask the ranger, what is this up here? And he'll say, well, that's obviously a bird. And over here might be another. And you say, well, what is this? And they say, well, can't you tell? Uh, the Indians are drawing a picture of a snake. Okay, yeah, I can see that's a snake. Well, what's this down here? Well, the Indians are drawing a picture of a deer over here. I say, oh, yeah, it looks like a deer. And, and you say, well, what's this right here? And they say, we don't know. It's a mythical creature. But I ask boys and girls all over the country, what does this look like? And right off the bat, they say, dinosaur. Of course, if we said dinosaur to the park ranger, he would say, no, dinosaurs didn't live with people. So then we'd ask him a question, a three-word question. What would it be? Were you there? Exactly. Hey, you know what else is interesting? In our modern times, scientists have actually found red blood cells and soft tissue in dinosaur bones. When they dissolve out the minerals, they're finding soft tissue in a lot of fossil bones now, actually not just dinosaurs. And I know when the scientist who first discovered this saw that, she was quite shocked. How could they be millions of years old? Well, they can't be. You know, as you drove to the Ark Encounter, Interstate 75, no doubt you saw this sign warning you of the dinosaurs crossing the interstate. Did you see that? No, we don't have one of those. We're worried about dinosaurs coming out because we come to the next age of dinosaurs, which is what? Faded. You know what? As far as we know, dinosaurs are extinct. But not just dinosaurs, lots of land animals have become extinct over time, lots of them, not just dinosaurs. But evolutionists are so interested in the dinosaurs. What happened to the dinosaurs? They have all these ideas, they died of indigestion, died of overeating, went on one of those diets you see on TV, got hit by an asteroid, died in the Ice Age. But for Buddy and I, it's really simple. There's no problem. Do you know what happened to the dinosaurs? They died. Do you know what? The flood caused massive climate change. Oh, that's interesting. Mr. Ham, you believe in climate change? Oh, there's been a lot of climate change since the flood. The Sahara Desert used to be very lush, rivers and all sorts of plants, and now it's desert. We weren't driving motor cars around then, and you know maybe the chariots with carbon dioxide coming out caused, no. Do you know something, mums and dads, young people? Do you realize if people don't believe the history in the Bible concerning the flood, if politicians don't understand what the flood did to this world and the climate change it's caused and the way it produced an ice age and so on, they're going to get it all wrong in regard to understanding climate change and they'll make all the wrong decisions. And that's what's happening, sadly. And you know, there's even politicians right now saying, we're going to destroy the earth in five years. We're going to destroy it in 10 years. Wrong. God promised that won't happen. He's the one that's going to destroy it with fire next time, not water. 
You know, in Genesis 8, after the flood, you know what God promised Noah? While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. So when a politician says, we're going to destroy the earth in five years or ten years, you say, wrong. And then switch the TV off. It's not worth watching. Wrong. That's right. Hey, you know what? It doesn't mean we shouldn't look after the earth for man's for, for God's glory and also to use it for man's good. But if you don't understand the flood and what the flood did to climate change, you're just going to get it all wrong. And then we come to the next age, which is what? Faded. Lots of animals have become extinct, including the dinosaurs. Faded. Yes, they have. And then we found dinosaur skeletons in 1824... I wasn't there then, but people found them. But that's not when they discovered dinosaurs, that's when they rediscovered dinosaurs, because Adam was the first one to discover a dinosaur. And I want to show you an interesting picture. If you look at this picture here, see these animals? That's a rabbit and a frog and a squirrel. You recognize these, and alligator and nautilus and a beaver and flamingo, and wow, you recognize these animals here. Do you know why I put that there? Evolutionists mock at Buddy and I for believing dinosaurs live with people. Dinosaurs live with people? How stupid can you get? Dinosaurs lived millions of years ago. They didn't live with people. You know what's interesting? All these animals live alongside of us, and there's many more. I just showed you some of them. Do you know you find fossils of those in what evolutionists would say are the same age rocks as the dinosaurs? And yet these all live with us. Do you know what that means? Evolutionists are all messed up because they don't believe God's word. And then we come to the last age of dinosaurs, which is what? Fiction. Fiction means what? Not true. What's one of the things that's not true? Millions of years. And evolution. And that people came from ape-like creatures. Anyone here today from Indianapolis, Indiana? Um, maybe a few of you. Well, you're probably familiar with this. This is the Children's Museum. Yes. And you know what they say? They say this is the best children's museum in America. Wrong. This is the best children's museum in America. What is that? <laughs> the Creation Museum. Yes. And also the Ark Encounter, because we tell the truth. No, these other museums have fun things and all the rest of it. But you know what? They lead boys and girls astray too. Because at the Children's Museum, they have a display of fossils. And you know what the signs say? Millions of years, millions of years, millions of years. Our children go there and get indoctrinated in millions of years, 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 millions of years. I call this the hall of fiction. Millions of years, millions of years, millions of years, millions of years. No, we want to tell children the truth. You know, dinosaurs are fascinating, but there's no mystery when you start with the history book of the universe, God's word. And think of what we did in this particular program. Real quickly, the seven ages of dinosaurs. When when they formed? Day six, when God made the land animals. They were vegetarian to start with, the fearless age. And then the fallen age, then sin affected the world, and now animals started eating each other, and the flood, that's why we find fossils of dinosaurs and other creatures all over the world. And the flood caused massive climate change, and because of that, lots of animals have become extinct. Maybe they, they, they died because of climate change, or people killing them, or they killed each other, or catastrophes, all sorts of reasons why animals become extinct. And then we found uh, skeletons of dinosaurs in the 1800s, and... Today, we're told a lot of things that are not true about dinosaurs, like millions of years and evolution. You know, Buddy and I call dinosaurs missionary lizards. We had a great friend, Dr. Gary Parker, who said dinosaurs are missionary lizards. And when you look at dinosaurs through the Bible, we know that dinosaur fossil is dead, and we know that Adam sinned, and that's why there's death in the world, and the Bible says the wages of sin is death, and because Adam sinned and we all come from Adam, all have sinned. How many of you are sinners in this room? Every one of you, that's right. Hey, wait a minute, as a sinner, your body's going to die, but you can't live with God because we're a sinner. You're going to live forever because we're made in the image of God. Oh, but while we were still sinners, Jesus Christ died for us. God sent his son to die for us. And if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Remember, Jesus said, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, if you put your faith and trust in me, you will be saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. 
And you know what God says? When you're a Christian, when you put your faith and trust in Jesus, repent of your sin, you are called children of God. And you know what God promises us? And now you know that you have eternal life with the Lord Jesus. No one can take that away from you. And so here's a summary of what we've been telling you. God made a perfect world, but Adam, the first man, sinned. And death came into the world. And we're all descendants of Adam and Eve, and that's why we're sinners, and that's why we die. 1,700 years after creation, people rebelled against God in a very big way, and so God judged with a flood, and that's why we find fossils all over the world. 2,000 years ago, God stepped into history to be the babe in a manger, Jesus, the God-man. And God promised Adam and Eve that back in the Garden of Eden, actually. Genesis 3.15 and Genesis 3.21 is really a promise of the Saviour. And then he died on the cross because death was a penalty for sin, but he rose from the dead, he conquered death, and only someone with infinite power could do that. And those who put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus repent of their sin and ask him into their life to be saved for eternity, then when they die, they go to be with him forever. Wow. Isn't that the message the world needs? That is the message that the world needs. You know, one of our favorite Bible verses, as we bring this to a close now, one of our favorite Bible verses, John 3:16. let's say it together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So here's what I want you to do. No clapping this time. Sit there really quietly. No clapping at the end. And Buddy's going to sing one last song. We're going to have Steve and John and Matt come out and sing as well so that you can sing along with them. And I want you to be thinking about these words, the words of John 3.16. And if there's anyone here, it doesn't matter whether you're a grandma, grandpa, teenager, child, whoever you are, if you've never put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus, that is the most important thing in the entire universe for you to do, to know you're going to live with God forever, then I pray that you would do that. And at the end, I'm going to put a prayer up on the screen, and Buddy's going to pray that prayer. And if any of you have never put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus, why don't you pray that prayer in your heart as Buddy prays it, and do that today, and then tell someone that you committed your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Then you'll know you'll be with God forever in heaven. So let's be nice and quiet, and at the end of this song, be nice and quiet, and Buddy will pray. This is the most important song that we've done today, so let's do it. Sing along. So love the world that he gave his only begotten son that do so be and when our savior died so we could be redeemed no greater words have my eyes ever gleaned than the marvelous words recorded in john 3 16 sing with us for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life for god so loved the world that he gave his own That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life.
life, put your heart in it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. bow your heads. You know, if you have not made Jesus your Lord and Savior, it's probably why you're here right now. And it's not the words that we're going to say, it's the Holy Spirit that's going to tell you that you need Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and you know you do. And we pray that you'll leave here with the greatest blessing that you're ever going to have, that you're going to be saved. So if you've never prayed this prayer, you can just pray right along with me right now. Lord God, I know that I have sinned against you. I have not obeyed you perfectly. And I repent. That just means turn from my sin. I love you and trust you with all my heart. I believe that your son Jesus died on a cross for my sin and rose from the grave. I trust in Jesus alone for salvation. Thank you for forgiving my sin, saving me, and making me part of your family. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Ken Ham, Mr. Buddy Davis.